He did not speak until he was four and did not read until he was seven, causing his teachers and parents to think he had learning disabilities and was antisocial. Eventually, he was expelled from school and was refused admittance to the Zurich Polytechnic School. It might have taken him a bit longer, but most people would agree that he caught on pretty well in the end, winning the Nobel Prize and changing the face of modern physics. His name? Albert Einstein. This so-called failure went on to confuse endless students with his complex science. He went on to change the face of physics and impact the world. Einstein overcame failure, but he wasn't the only one. Simon Peter was one of Jesus's closest disciples, but he displayed a particular tendency for saying the wrong thing at the wrong time. His life reached a low point with his infamous denial of Jesus three times the day before his crucifixion. Yet within a couple of months, Peter was boldly preaching about Jesus at Pentecost and became one of the greatest leaders in the history of the church. What made the difference? An encounter with the risen Jesus who helped Peter to overcome his failures. As John 21 reads, Simon Peter decided he was going out fishing, something for which is often criticised. Peter, why are you run running away from God's call on your life to go fishing? But it's more likely that he may have just been going out to earn some money as he waited for Jesus to appear to the disciples at Galilee, as he had promised. Peter was just living out his everyday life. He had been trained and was fishing at the right time, at night, and yet caught nothing. In the midst of this failure, Jesus arrives. We read, early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore. But the disciples did not realise that it was Jesus. Just like on the road to Emmaus, Jesus is present to help, but initially the disciples don't recognise him. But as he watches, he is waiting to help, to help the disciples to fish. Yes, for food, but also metaphorically for people. Jesus is waiting to help us too. But this help is only of any use if we welcome his intervention. Jesus wants to be actively involved, but we need to recognise our need for his help. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? Jesus' use of the word friends speaks of the father heart of God. A God who wants to come and be with us. When Jesus asks the question, the disciples don't give the closed defensive response of, no, we're fine, thanks, that we often give. But instead, they welcome his help. However awkward or challenging it may be, to be effective in our mission, we must welcome Christ's intervention. And then we must obey his instructions. Jesus instructed the disciples to throw their nets on the right side of the boat. The result? A miraculous catch of fish. We don't know whether this instruction was based on a word of knowledge about where the fish were, or actually was a miracle of Jesus calling the fish. Either way, the Creator has all the knowledge and power that we will ever need. He knows more about the fish than the fishermen. He knows more about accountancy than the accountant. More about business than the entrepreneur. More about parenting than parents. More about teaching than teachers. More about life and more about reaching people than we ever do. And today... Jesus is longing to help us in every area of our life and ministry. He is in every circumstance, even if we don't recognise him. 
But for God's whispers to impact our fishing, we need to obey. We need to let go of our past failures and respond once more to God's invitation. Moving on from this miracle, Jesus invites Peter into a renewed relationship, forgiven and set free from his failures. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it's the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him and jumped into the water. This is the one who had denied Jesus, who could clearly be seen as a failure. But as Peter saw the risen Jesus, he doesn't run from him in shame, but runs to him. What a wonderful picture for us. Shame isn't of God. Failure is not final in God's kingdom. We can have the freedom and confidence to run to him. Jesus tenderly gives the invitation, come and have breakfast. The risen Jesus still wants to serve the disciples, even after their failures. And the same applies to us. In this safe relational context, Jesus brings to Peter the message that he has come to share. I will heal you from your past failures. I will use you again. Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Is the start of one of the most tense and dramatic dialogues in all of literature. In this passage, which sees Simon Peter healed from his former failures, Jesus initially digs up the past. Firstly, Jesus has just cooked the fish on a charcoal fire. The only other place that this word is used in the entire New Testament is in John 18.18, 18, when Peter is warming himself by the fire when he denied Jesus. Secondly, Jesus deliberately addresses him as Simon, son of John, and not Peter, the rock. This only serves to highlight Peter's failure to live up to that name and reinforces his need for restoration. Finally, Jesus deliberately asks Peter the same basic question three times, reflecting that Peter has denied him three times. But Jesus doesn't do these things to make Peter feel shame for his denial. He does it to bring him to a place of repentance, restoration and recommissioning. To move forward, we have to acknowledge we have a problem. And as Jesus causes Peter to recognise his problem, he then releases him to leave it there. But he does this by going straight to the root of the problem. And he asks, do you love me? Jesus is highlighting that the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. He is saying, Peter, the reason you denied me was a love issue. You loved yourself, your reputation, what others thought of you more than you loved me. And today... Our failure to fulfil the great commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul and strength is at the heart of our struggles. For Peter to be fit for service, Jesus knows he has to come and deal with the heart issue. And that is what he does. Amazingly, Jesus is not put off by Peter's denial. He doesn't stop believing in him. For Peter, and for us today, the call is greater than the fall. Peter, having faced up to his sin and having reaffirmed his love for Jesus, is recommissioned. And through this, we see such a wonderful aspect of God's character. That our God is the God of the second chance. Thomas Edison was working on a crazy contraption called a light bulb. And it took a whole team of men 24 straight hours to put just one together. The story goes that when Edison was finished with one light bulb, he gave it to a young boy helper who nervously carried it up the stairs. Step by step, 
He cautiously watched his hands, obviously frightened of dropping such a priceless piece of work. You've probably guessed what happened by now. The poor young boy dropped the bulb at the top of the stairs. It took the entire team of men 24 more hours to make another bulb. Finally, tired and ready for a break, Edison was ready to have his bulb carried up the stairs. He gave it to the same young boy who dropped the first one. That's true forgiveness. He gave him a second chance. How amazing that our God gave Peter and gives us all a second chance. The call is greater than the fool. And because of that, a few weeks later, Peter is leading the disciples and preaching with boldness about the crucified, risen and exalted Jesus. No denying him here. 3,000 people get saved, baptised and added to the church in one day. Peter is instrumental in the first recorded healing miracle of the early church. He is put in prison, is released by an angel, confronts sin with scary discernment and walks the streets of Jerusalem with such an anointing that the sick try just to get to his shadow so that they might be healed. And if that was not enough, he is given the privilege of being the first to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. And even today he is honoured, along with Paul, as being the most significant leader of the church to which we belong. Wow. All this from a man who failed. A man who failed but who was given another go. What hope. What restoration. And so today, perhaps you are still living in the shame of past failure. Perhaps the mess-ups of your past mean you have never felt good enough for God. Perhaps you have failed Christ in the past, took the wrong route and gone your own way. Perhaps you're wondering whether you can ever get on with God's plan for your life. Look at Peter. God restored this man. He reordained him. He worked miracles through him. But from that day... Did Peter have everything sorted? No way. But still God used him in mighty ways. Today God wants to come and help you to face up to the past. He wants to forgive you, to restore you, to heal you and to recommission you. God made you. He has a plan for you. Christ came to earth to restore us. Not only from the damage done to us by others, but also from the damage we have done to ourselves. Will you take this opportunity to let the risen Christ redeem your past and minister to you in the present? For if you do, your future is brighter than you can ever imagine. Welcome the intervention. Obey his instructions and accept the invitation. Come and be restored. Come and be redeemed. God bless you.